Amen? Amen? And we were in Sudbury for seven years, so I just want you to know that this is probably snow up there. So that's why I'm rejoicing today. It's rain. I can handle rain. I can handle rain. We want to welcome you to our service. I'm going to open up in prayer, but for those that are here in the auditorium, just a reminder, because of COVID, uh, we are uh, not supposed to be singing, but that doesn't stop us from worshiping our Lord. All right? We want to encourage you to do that. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that, God, this is the day that you have made. God, no matter what our circumstances, whatever situation we may find ourselves in, God, I pray that you would help us to rejoice in you. That, God, we would give you the praise and the glory that you are worthy of. We thank you for the rain, that, God, it helps things grow. And, God, we thank you for your blessings that are with us each and every day. Be glorified in everything said and done, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. Good morning, church. Can we, can we stand? Hallelujah. We will continue to celebrate the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He's alive today. Amen. Hallelujah. You can sing it from your heart. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen.
something I can't explain. No other name above your name, Jesus. Something about your name. Matchless, undeniable, priceless, irresistible. Every tongue confess, every knee will bow. Something about your name, something I care. Something about your name. Oh, there's something about your name. Let's worship the Lord. Oh. Something about your name, there's something, oh, there's something, there's something, something about your name, there's something, there's something, there's something, something about your name, there's something.
glorify your name, O oh Jesus. Hallelujah. Give me praise. Give me praise. Hallelujah, Lord. Every breath we could ever breathe will live for you. Mm-hmm. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We'll live for you, oh, we'll live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonders and show me who you are and fill me in your heart.
Our God is good. Amen. I think if King David was around today, he'd love this song. David writes in Psalms 11, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. If you find yourself in difficult situation of life right now I want you to know that God that God is with you right now God is with you right now and sometimes it's when we go through those hard difficult lonely situations that we find God like never before that we find him and exactly as we need him He's with you. He's with you. Draw near to him. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you, God, for the promise of your word. That, God, you are with us. You will never leave us. You will never forsake us. And, God, our, our walk is a walk of faith, not sight. Feelings go up and down. Things around us may change. But you are our stronghold, our rock our foundation on which we stand. And God, we put our faith and our trust in you right now. God, I pray for people right now, and God, you know their situations and circumstances. God, I pray right now for those with physical needs, those sick in body, I pray that God, your presence, healing power would touch their life, bring strength and wholeness in Jesus' name. That name that is above every other name, we pray in the name of Jesus. 
God, other circumstances, financial jobs. God, I pray right now that you would provide, that God, you would open the door, that God, you would perform miracles where things seem to be shut down and closed, you will provide. And that God, your people will know you like never before. And God will praise you, not just for what you've done, but for who you are. God, we're going to praise you. We're going to thank you even before you do it because you're worthy of all praise and all glory. God, I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Again, we want to welcome you here, both in the building and if you're watching at home or wherever, we want to welcome you here as well. We want to uh, thank you for your faithfulness and uh, in giving over these last this last year, but definitely several months. And we want to let you know that you can still give. We just pray that you would uh, continue to to give and support the church. Uh, you can do that online through the website and also the connection if you're watching online today. But the guest services will also be open for those who are here in the building to give after the service. Uh, because of uh, COVID, we do have some restrictions. And again, reminding you that uh, if you're planning on coming to the service, we can still have 15%, but you need to pre-register. Uh, that usually comes up uh, on available to register starting Monday. And so you can check online and please do that because we are only allowed so many people. Uh, we want to thank you, especially when you're here. And if you haven't been here before, if you weren't here with us last weekend, it is a different way to come to church and kind of how you have to come in and go through the registration. And then you're shown to a seat. And uh, we do just want to encourage you just to try to stay there and to keep social distance uh, while you're within the building. Now, saying that, we will dismiss you in a certain way, just like you were led in and we sat you in a certain uh, seat. We'll also dismiss you by rows. So please uh, wait until uh, you're dismissed, and I'll mention more of that at the uh, end of the service. Uh, the washrooms are available, but we're asking again just to cut down the number of people moving around, that that is um, just used for emergencies. Um, just to take note, the annual business meeting is coming up on Sunday, April 25th. The food bank are covered. Uh, we are taking donations. You can drop them off to the, the church or bring them with you on Sunday. That is greatly appreciated. Uh, this afternoon at 4 o'clock, uh, there is a Zoom uh, leaders meeting for small group leaders, and I sent out some information about that, and you should have got that. And I think that's everything. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Pastor Fraz is coming up. I thought the worship team was going to do something, and then they've all left me. They're very quiet. They left, and I didn't even notice. Pastor Fraz. Well, good morning, church. How are you doing? Good. You're doing okay? On another, another lockdown, another, or I guess this is our first lockdown Sunday. And uh, I just wanted to just start today uh, with a little bit of levity. And uh, I found some COVID-related jokes that I wanted to share with you. And uh, yeah, you know, these are serious times, are they not? These are serious times. And uh, I, I just wanted to just make sure that, you know, uh, it is serious, but we believe that God is still here, and we just believe that even in the middle of all this, that he can still do good things. And so, anyway, I, I don't know if you'll find these funny or not. If you do find them funny, um, you can't sing, but I didn't see anything in the restrictions about laughing. And so, feel free to laugh. Feel free to throw up some laughing emojis online. Um, oh, that might be me. Should I get the handheld? Okay, here we go. Why did the chicken cross the road? Because the chicken behind him did not know how to socially distance properly. I, I, I thought that was pretty good. Um, there were two grandmothers who were bragging about their precious little grandchildren. And one of them said to the other, mine are so good at social distancing, they won't even call me. My mom always told me I wouldn't accomplish anything by laying in bed all day. But look at me now, Ma. I'm saving the world. 
I, I, I like that one a lot. I never thought the comment, I wouldn't touch them with a six foot pole would actually become a national policy, but here we are. Um, I, you may not find this one funny. Maybe you need to have uh, younger children. Um, I, I, I laughed and I cried at this one. I'm not talking to myself. I'm having a parent teacher conference right now. Mm. Nothing like relaxing on the couch after a long day of being tense on the couch. Uh, if this is true for you, it's funny and sad. I finished Netflix today. There's Crave and Disney TV, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> quarantine has put a real damper on comedy. For months, nobody has walked into a bar. What did the astronauts say to NASA when they notified them that their mission was complete and they could return to Earth? Thanks, but no thanks. And there was one more. Uh, my wife advised me not to say it. Uh, I'm going against the better judgment of my better half, but, but here we go. Um, there was a, oh, oh, I, I'll just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna use my in-laws names. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, upon hearing of the new lockdown restrictions, Mrs. Smith packed her bags and said she was leaving. And Mr. Smith replied, where are you going? And she said, I'm moving in with my hairdresser. And I don't know how many men or women can relate to that. My wife's been doing a great job with my hair, uh, a lot of hallway, backyard haircuts. But anyway, I, I just wanted to say, church, for here on and online, these are trying times, are they not? They're trying times. And I think now more than ever, we just need to show a little bit of grace, don't we? Uh, I know that emotions are high. Uh, many times when my wife and I have gone out, we have seen some pretty intense emotions. We've seen some fairly intense reactions, uh, both in buildings, outside of buildings, coming into buildings. And I just feel in my heart that we, especially as a people of God, we need to show an extra measure of grace because we don't know what people are struggling with. All you see is a little snippet when you see them in the store, when you see them from a distance, but we are all going home to something, and we don't know what that is for somebody else, and I just feel in my heart, I needed to say that we just need a little bit of grace, amen? We need a little bit of grace for people because we don't know what they're walking through. We don't know, what, you know what's on their road of life, and we just need to show the love and the grace of God like never before. I tell you, it is getting easier to say things you ought not to say, respond and react in ways you ought not to respond or react in. But I believe now more than ever, the people of God need to allow the presence of God to smooth and calm our souls so that we can be a people of love, so that we can be a people whose words are seasoned with grace. Amen? Because again, we don't know what people are walking on their road, uh, on their road of life. And so we're going to be starting a new series today uh, just called Meeting Jesus on the Road of Life. And in this series, we're just going to examine uh, passages where people met Jesus after the resurrection. And what's so powerful about these post-resurrection appearances is that he actually met people who were either on the verge of giving up or perhaps on the verge of never believing at all. And yet despite their context, despite the hopelessness and the despair in their context, Jesus met them anyway on the road of life. Even though, even if they felt they had really good excuses not to believe in Jesus and just to move on. And so today's message just starts off with a question and it's this. Can my excuses get in the way of seeing the way forward. Anyone here make good at making excuses? If that's you online, you can say, yep, I, I'm, I'm the king of excuses. I am Mr. or Mrs. Procrastinator. I'm the king of excuses. Yeah, there's oh, there's some young people in the audience, very honest, <laughs> as their moms are like, put your hand down. It's okay. It's okay. I see another hand over there. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I, I, honestly, how many people do we know who perhaps in the middle of quarantine have bought a home gym, but the gym is still in the box? Or worse yet, maybe in my case, you may have bought something like a workout bench and you put it together, but you've only ever been on it once. And you're not even really sure how it works. How many people do we know who had a doctor's appointment and they knew they should have gone, but something just came up? That there's excuse after excuse after excuse. And the truth is, I think sometimes the excuses are kind of flimsy, aren't they? I mean, when you say, well, I haven't gotten to that yet because... 
But sometimes the excuses seem pretty good. Um, today is April, April 11th, and almost a year ago today, I uh, got into a bit of an argument with my wife. Not like a real argument, but it was, it was close-ish. And uh, you can interpret that however you want. But we had a, dis we had a disagreement. <clears throat> um, and the disagreement was about <clears throat> COVID. Because at that point in time last year, COVID had lasted just a couple of weeks. And I was telling my wife, I said, babe, trust me. It's only going to be like another month or two at the most. This is nuts. There's no way it's going to be shut down for like a year. There's no way. And my wife said, yeah, but. And I said, no, babe, you're just making excuses. You're not seeing reality. There's just no way. And it turns out my wife was right. Actually, I've noticed that a lot in my life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that's another mess sermon altogether. But there are some excuses that just seem really good, don't they? There are those flimsy excuses about maybe why you never started working out or you never went on that walk or you never went to the doctor or whatever. But there are just some excuses that just seem so good that it just seems to be a valid reason. And, and, and you wonder, how can you, how can you see hope how can you see hope for the future when your present is filled with excuses that are filled with doubt and despair and disappointment? When those excuses just seem so real and you can't see any way around them. And, and I don't know about you, but it feels like to me that in this context, hope, hope has become very rare, hasn't it? As I turn on the news I, uh, this past week when um, our premier made the announcement uh, I was listening, and within hours, analysts began uh, commenting on the economic fallout from this latest stay-at-home order. And I'm sure they already have, but they're probably now reporting on the mental health fallout and the emotional fallout and the fallout of children's health and the fallout of family statuses happening all across the world right now. And I think we're realizing now more than ever that this thing called hope is not an accessory to life. It's not just an add-on that you and I desperately need to have a sense of hope in our lives every single day. And I think before this pandemic, I think there were some of us, maybe many of us, and we treated hope as if it was some sort of accessory. That, it, you know, in addition to the car and the house and going to the gym and, and going out with my friends, that in addition to all these, yeah, it'd be nice to have hope. But if I don't, it's okay. Because why? I've got my buddies. I, I've got a plan. I've got my career. I've got money. And I wonder now, more than ever, we are realizing that hope is important. I mean, if you could pick between your hobbies and hope, what would you pick? If you could pick between financial wealth and hope, what would you pick? And it's not to say those are mutually exclusive, but in this season, it seems like it, doesn't it? That hope is in rare supply. And I want you to know that despite your context, there is hope for you in your boat. There's hope for your boat. I've said it before. We're all in the same storm, but we're all on the different boat. That you are actually experiencing crisis and tragedy and quarantine differently than anyone else. And odds are many people do not know the specifics of what you are going through. But regardless of the context you're in, there is still hope for you. There is still hope for this world. There is still hope for this church. There is still hope for your family. And that hope is something that Jesus Christ gives in ample supply. But I get it. It's easy to say, but it's hard to live when you're living in a circumstance that is filled with despair, filled with doubt, filled with so many, honestly, good reasons why it's just hard to believe. And in our passage today, two of the followers of Christ found themselves in the exact same predicament. It was just a few days after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, and he had risen to life on the third day, but these two disciples didn't know that. To them, Jesus was dead. To them, hope was gone. And in that context of their despair, in the context of their hopelessness, in the context of them just giving up on life as they walked to this neighboring village, Jesus met them in the middle. And I believe with all my heart, whatever you're facing today, he will meet you in the middle of whatever you're in. He's right here with you right now. Even as you watch online, you need to know 
He is in your context. And this passage in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 24 is a powerful example that no matter what you're facing, even if like these two, you're on the verge of giving up, he still comes beside you. Here's what the Gospel of Luke says, chapter 24, starting in verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. Now Emmaus was about seven or so miles, 10 kilometers away from Jerusalem. And when Christ was crucified, there was a popular Jewish festival or holiday called Passover. It celebrated the time where God saved his people from the Egyptians. And so there would have been, would have been a lot of people in Jerusalem at that point in time. And kind of like the GTA, it might have been hard to get lodging, hard to get housing right in the middle of Jerusalem. And so people would often stay in neighboring towns. And that's where they were walking. And as they walked, uh, talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. I've always wondered about that verse. Jesus was the one they probably needed to see more than anyone else, but Jesus did not allow himself to be seen. And I wondered why. Well, why, why couldn't they see Jesus? Have you ever wondered that in your life? In the middle of what you're going through, why can't I see Jesus? Where is he as I walk on this road of grief and disappointment? And we'll read later that they did see him, but before they saw him, they needed to understand something. And we'll read that passage just a little bit later on in this message. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still with their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet. Really interesting. Powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. And what's interesting about prophet is that's what the Muslims believe today, don't they? Muslims believe that Jesus was nothing more than a prophet. Just a, a, a person who did powerful works, but not the divine son of God. And here are people who are arguably followers of Jesus Christ. And yet, even though they followed him, it didn't occur to him to them that he was the divine son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity. They just saw him as some guy who did cool things. Now that's obviously an oversimplification, but they simply didn't see Jesus for who he was. And that will transition into our text. And you're going to see a word come up a couple of times. It's a, it's a three-letter word, but it was a big word for them. It, it, was a, it was the line between doubt and faith. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our, our women amazed us, and they went to the tomb early this morning. But they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who had said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But, but they did not see Jesus. And it was more than just a statement, wasn't it? It was the state of their hearts. They couldn't see him. They couldn't perceive him. They didn't know him. They thought he was just some prophet. They could not perceive and understand that he was the holy son of God sent by God the Father to save the world. But they couldn't see him. Their, I guess you could say, their but, B-U-T, got in the way of seeing that Jesus could make a way. And it makes me wonder for me, are my excuses getting in the way of seeing that God can make a way. Are your excuses in your life? I don't have enough of this. I don't have enough of that. I don't look like this. I don't look like that. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough freedom. Whatever the excuse may be, are my excuses getting in the way of believing that God can make a way for your life? He can make a way for your family. He can wake a may, make a way in your career. He can make a way 
in that purpose that he's put in your heart, but it just feels so far away? Are your excuses getting in the way of believing that regardless of your context, he still journeys beside you on the road of life? Do you believe it, church? Do you believe he's here today? Do you believe he's here for you today? Or are our hearts filled with buts or excuses? And, and you know what I've learned about excuses? Some excuses are actually doubts in disguise. Uh, one of the things I've heard some people say is that they've wanted to use stay-at-home orders and quarantine and lockdown as an opportunity to learn an instrument. Anyone ever think that? Maybe online, and you would say, you know what, I, I had thought that it would be possible for me to learn an instrument. Maybe you pick up the piano or the guitar, and for whatever reason, it just didn't work. In fact, I've often heard many people say, there's just no way that I could ever learn an instrument. I'm just not musical. Do you know that there's scientific evidence that, that that's bogus? That it actually is possible for you to learn. Maybe you can't become a Mozart, and that's okay. But it actually is possible for you to learn an instrument. And so the excuses of, I don't have enough time. The excuses of, well, I, I, I'm just not sure that I can. Or the excuse of, oh, that's a huge commitment. It's actually not a real excuse. And that's why it makes me wonder if some excuses are just doubts in disguise. Have you ever said to yourself, there is just no way that God can make a way. There's just no way God can make a way in my context. There's just no way God can make a way in this marriage. There's just no way God can make a way in my health. How do you know that? What evidence are you citing that, that makes you show, so sure that there's just no way God can make a way? How do you know that excuse is so true? And you know what the problem with with doubt is there are the, the problem is that the reasons for some of our doubts seem like really good reasons don't they like in the middle of COVID-19 I don't know about you but it just feels like for me that stay-at-home orders seem like a really good excuse to just stay on the couch my wife was telling me the other day you need to go for a run you got to get up off the couch I'm like all right babe I'm going but it, th doesn't it feel that way for you that, that in this context it just seems like there are such good reasons to give up, to, to perhaps neglect or forget that we still serve a God who can do all things. Like, even in the case of these disciples, I mean, look at what they said in verse 21. We had hope that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. Now, look at it from their perspective. They had just seen Jesus Christ be crucified. They had seen the nails in his hands. They had seen the, 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 the unbelievable agony of being crucified on the cross. From their point of view, the, the, the reason of giving up on him seemed really good. It looked like he was really gone. And yet we know that in the spiritual realm, there was actually a war being waged between doubt and faith in those disciples' hearts. And even as I look at our context today, our battle is not just against the virus. And, and please don't misunderstand me. I, I think we need to defeat the virus, whatever that means. As soon as it's my turn, I'm going to get the needle. I don't like needles, so I'm kind of glad, you know, no one's going to be there because I, 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 I might pass out. That's just me. I, I'm... I really am not good with needles. I don't know why. You can ask my wife. I'm a big baby. They got to lie me down sometimes. It's actually pretty pathetic and embarrassing. But look, our battle is not just against the virus right now. There is a war being waged between doubt and faith. There's, a, there's spiritual warfare happening right now in your life. There's a battle between doubt and faith. And I'm telling you something, and, and I think you already know this, but if you lose that battle, if you lose the doubt, it will cost you something precious. It will cost you a peace that passes all understanding in your mind. It will cost you hope in your soul. There's a battle being waged right now in your heart, soul, and mind that you absolutely cannot afford to lose because God has great things in store for you. But you have to believe. 
you have to believe that no matter what, God still loves you. And he meets you. He meets you on the road of wherever you're going. And, and you know, as I was thinking about this war, inner war, uh, I said this in a message probably about three months ago. But I have a concern. And my concern is this, that on the first day when they kind of let us out, you know, of whatever we're in, my concern is that people aren't going to go back to normal, that they're going to keep living in this battle, that, that on the first day of taking your mask off, on the first day of going to Disneyland or Wonderland or African Line Safari or wherever it is you take your crew, on the first day, the battle will still be raging. Oh, maybe the door to your prison has been opened, but you're still in there. And I just sense in my heart that we need to be mindful that there is a spiritual battle happening in addition to this battle against the virus. And losing this battle will cost you something. If Jesus had not met those disciples on the road, that state of despair would have been their new normal. And praise God that the disciples who had given into despair were met by Jesus Christ on the road. And I believe with my whole heart that regardless of what you're facing, even if, even if you're on the verge of giving up, even if you have given up, he still meets you in the middle of whatever you're facing. He meets you in the middle of your context, whatever your context might be right now. And I know as a pastor, there are many contexts. There's emotional context and health context and people context. Whatever you're facing, he meets you in the middle, but there's a catch. He doesn't meet you in the middle to camp or to stay there. He meets you in the middle to keep you moving forward. But that's the problem with excuses, isn't it? Excuses, at least some of them, will tempt you to stay in the middle. Now, the middle is not a bad place. The middle is between where you were and where you're going, so at least you've made some ground. In our faith, we often, talked about, we often talk about the middle being between God's promises and the experience of that promise. The middle can be a place where your faith maybe is stretched. The middle can be a place where it feels like you're abandoned, but the middle can still be a place where your faith grows as you see his faithfulness in the land of the living. The middle can be a very productive place provided that you're moving forward. But when I read this text, when I read about Cleopas and whoever the other person was, when I read about their lives, you don't really get the sense that they were moving forward, do you? I mean, even in this text, it says that they were going to a village called Emmaus. They were going somewhere, but you can get the sense that in a lot of ways, they were going nowhere. You ever feel like that? Like you're moving, even now, like you're moving you somehow find the courage and the fortitude to do the laundry. Like, you're doing stuff, but are you moving forward? And I think this problem becomes incredibly more intensified when it comes to people you love. How do you convince people, especially the people you love, that you have to keep moving forward, that it's still possible to keep moving forward? Just this past week, um, one of the things I'm thankful that they did not close were parks. Uh, you know, children's parks and whatnot. And so we've been going to the park uh, several times this past week. And to be honest, we'll probably go to the park several times next week and the week after that because there's not many other places to take your kids right now. And I remember we were there, and the kids were all playing, and the adults are all kind of socially distant, and we're all like, oh, don't get too close or whatever. Or, ah. You know, and so we're just, you know, we were just, we were there. And about, you know, seven or eight feet from me was a, a gentleman who was about the same age as me. I, I didn't know him. You know, we're, we're relatively new to the area. And as our children are playing, he just looked up to me. And, and, and again, I, I don't know him. He just looked up to me and he said, COVID is taking everything away from us. And then he just stood there, like his face just downcast. And I thought to myself, what depth of ex despair does someone need to experience to tell that? to a random stranger. That COVID's taken everything from me. And it feels like I've got nothing left. And I, I, I encouraged him, but I could just tell by the way that he walked, you know, kind of chasing the family, that even though he was moving, literally, in a lot of ways, 
you as moving nowhere. How, how do you convince people to stop moving aimlessly and to keep moving forward, even though it's painful? to keep moving forward in faith that, that somehow God will make all things work together for good for those who love him. And, and it's so easy to say, isn't it? I can just rhyme off Romans 8, 28, no problem. It's so easy to say, but how do you live it? How do you live it when you've experienced that devastating loss? Like in this text, you know, there's a word here that honestly I just glossed over for like the last 12 years but now in the middle of this pandemic, in the middle of stay-at-home orders, this one word, I think for me, has taken on a lot deeper meaning. They stood still, their faces downcast. The word just means sad, but I think we're getting the sense now, aren't we, that there is a despair and, and a grief that they're just, they're giving into. They're convinced that there's just no way out. And there in the middle between Jerusalem and Emmaus, they're on the road of life, but they're giving up. They're just giving up. And they don't even know it's Jesus talking to them. And, you know, I've often wondered, well, why didn't Jesus just say, hey, surprise, I'm alive, it's okay. And eventually he did, but I think he just wanted them to learn and to understand that disappointment and despair can blind you to that which you cannot afford to miss. And before Jesus just gave them the answer, before he just kind of appeared out of nowhere, I think he wanted them to understand the danger of despair and disappointment. And he wanted to lead them out of that place. There's a <clears throat> old hymn. It's, a, uh, it's actually one of my favorite hymns. It's called Before the Throne of God Above. I have a strong and perfect plea. I won't sing it for you because I'm not a singer. But there's a, a line in the, in the song, and it says, when Satan tempts me to despair. And I just, I just the past week, I was just doing some research on despair and faith, and I came across two thoughts um, that uh, I think really, really impacted me. The first thought is this that despair is a tactic of the enemy. Despair happens in life to anyone and everyone, but despair is also a tactic of the enemy of our souls. If he can use despair to discourage you out of the kingdom of Christ, he will. That, and, and maybe we're learning now more than ever before, but it's a potent weapon, isn't it? More than setback, more than heartbreak and disappointment, despair is a powerful and potent weapon against the human soul that, unfortunately, I think he knows how to wield with excellence. But then I came across this other thought, and this one's going to sting. The research that I kind of was reading, and I would fall into this category as well, said that many Christians have a very weak theology of grace. That we can say things like, you know, th you know uh, we don't understand the height or the depth or the breadth of God's love. We can rhyme off verses about God's love and grace, but when it comes right down to it in our hearts, souls, and minds, that this theology of the grace of Jesus Christ has not really taken very deep root. And, and here's the problem. You have, on the one hand, an enemy who has a very potent weapon. It's honestly, despair, I feel, is one of the deadliest weapons in his arsenal. And then you combine that with the fact that there are many who have a very weak shield. They, they have a very poor theology of grace. You have a potent weapon and a weak shield in a context in a, of a pandemic and stay-at-home orders. And you're seeing people struggle like never before. Despair is running rampant. And so as I thought about this, I thought, wow, what a, what a powerful spiritual principle. That yes, it is a potent weapon, but this is an opportunity to develop that shield of faith, to develop a robust and a healthy theology of God's grace. But as I thought about that, though, I thought, okay, well, I don't want to just give you a spiritual principle. I wanted to give you something practical, too. And, and this is the most practical piece of advice I can give you. Even if you don't believe in Christianity, I think you could take this advice 
And if you could just do it, you'd probably spare yourself a lot of regret. Do not make significant decisions when you're in despair. I feel right now there are people in their hearts here or watching online, and you are contemplating significant decisions. This season isn't what you thought it was going to be. Life didn't work out the way you wanted. You, you didn't realize you'd be in this stay-at-home context. I get it. We're all in it. But do not make significant decisions in despair. Because if you make a significant decision in the depths of despair, you'll only end up living in regret. And it pains me. It hurts me when I see God's people making decisions in despair. And you know why they do it, right? We tend to make decisions in despair because instead of, instead of gazing at God and glancing at grief, we fall into the trap of glancing at God and gazing at grief. Instead of gazing at God and glancing at grief, we fall into the trap of glancing at God and gazing at grief. And I think you have to glance at grief. You have to admit and acknowledge that which ails you. But when you focus on your crisis, you will miss what Christ has in store for you. There is still a way out. There is still a plan for your life. If the resurrection truly did happen, death and sin and despair and disappointment and darkness do not have to have the final word. Because he meets you on the road to make a way. I, uh, I love this passage. Um, I've read it so many times because I, I feel like in a lot of ways it's been my life at various times. When I was stuck in the middle of where I was and where I felt God wanted me to be, but just stuck in the middle of despair. And, and it's encouraged me so much because just as Christ met them in the middle of whatever they were facing, I believe with all my heart in various times in my life that he has met me. But I, I, I go back to that one line. They were kept from recognizing him. I mean, Jesus was the one person they needed to see. Later on in this passage, we didn't read it, but they were so enthralled, so moved by the words of this stranger that they actually invited him, not knowing it was Jesus, to come and eat with them. And then at that supper, he broke bread and gave thanks. And when he gave it to them, their eyes were open and they saw Jesus. But as soon as they saw him, he disappeared. Why? Was there something that needed to happen in their hearts? Verse 32 in this passage says something that I think needed to happen for them. And maybe for us. Were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road? When he opened the scriptures, when he told them about Moses, when he shared all the, prof the prophetic words, their hearts began to burn with hope. In the middle of whatever you're facing, in the middle of another stay-at-home order, in the middle of quarantine, is it possible for your heart to burn with hope concerning your context? In the middle of whatever you're facing, is it possible for your heart to burn with hope concerning your relationships, concerning your children, concerning your career, concerning your loved ones? Is it possible that in the middle of disappointment, upon experiencing Christ, you can experience the hope of a way out, the hope of moving forward? Do you believe it, church? Do, do, do you believe that there's still a way out? And you know what's funny? Because in this passage, as Jesus was explaining to them, they said something. Three words. But, but, but. But, but, but. You ever say that to God? God, but this. God, God, but that. Does Jesus care about your butt? One T, by the way. Does he care? D did Jesus care about their excuses? I think so. Does Jesus care about your excuses? I think so. The Bible says in 1 Peter, cast all your care on him because he cares for you. Or he, he cares about you. Your disappointments matter to God, but he won't let you live there. He won't let you live there. When he met these disciples on the road, he found them in despair and darkness. I'll invite the worship team to come on back up. 
and yet he led them out of that darkness. And what really interests me is how did Jesus Christ lead these disciples out of a place of despair and darkness? And he did something really interesting. In verse 27, this is what happened before their hearts began to burn with hope. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. The hope that Christ had for them was found in his presence and in his word. In his presence and in his word is the hope that you and I need. In his presence and in his word is the hope that you need to face the storms of your life. In his presence and his word is the hope that you need to believe that no matter what's broken inside, he can still heal. In his presence and in his word is the hope that you and I need to face whatever we're facing. In his presence and in his word is the hope that you need to continue through these stay-at-home orders. In his presence and in his word is the hope that you need to face your deepest, darkest demons believing that in Christ, yours can still be the victory. Do we still believe in the power of his presence and in the power of his word? Do we still believe that just one touch, just, just one glimpse of his presence? You know, normally when I, I end a message, I'll give you some practical tip. But today, I just wanted to read some scriptures over you. Because I believe with my whole heart that as we allow him, that as we allow his presence to lead us to the word, it will give us the hope that we need to face anything. As our team begins to play, there are three passages that I found I just wanted to encourage you with. It's what Jeremiah says. This is what the Lord says. He who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it. The Lord is his name. Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. Put your faith in him. Trust in him. Lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. I got another one here. Man, I love his word. I've been reading this book a lot lately. I don't think God caused COVID, but I, I believe he's, he's been using it in my life to draw me closer to his presence and his word. This is Hezekiah's prayer. Hezekiah was going to die, but after praying for 15 more years, God granted it to him. And, and I love this passage because Hezekiah is just so honest about the anguish in his soul. And I know everyone... Not everyone, but there are many who are just trying to put on a brave face. It's okay to be honest about the anguish in your soul. This is what Hezekiah said. But what can I say? He has spoken to me, and he himself has done this. I will walk humbly all my years because of this anguish in my soul. Lord, by such things men live, and my spirit finds life in them too. You restored me to health and let me live. Surely it was for my benefit that I suffer such anguish. In your love, you kept me from the pit of destruction. You have put all my sins behind your back. The living, the living, they praise you as I am doing today. Fathers, tell your children about your faithfulness. The Lord will save me. Believe it, church, the Lord will save me. And we will sing with stringed instruments all the days of our lives in the temple of the Lord. Can I do one more? Oh, I remember this one from about 10 years ago. I remember reading this. I pray that it gives you comfort today. I don't know where you are on the road of life. These are the words of Jesus Christ himself. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. For I have overcome the world. In his presence and in his word, we find hope. He's worthy, church, isn't he? He's worthy for what he has done. And he's worthy 
for what he is doing. And I know that it might be hard to hear this. But one of the most productive things you can do right now is to continue to build your life on his presence and his word. And even as this world washes away things in our lives that we used to depend on, things in our lives that we, we just can't see ourselves doing for a while, this is your opportunity to allow yourself to build your life on his presence and his word. So as we worship him, I invite you to open up your heart. If you're watching from home, you can sing to your heart's content. Over here, I invite you to stand. And even though you can't sing the way you'd like to, I invite you to open your heart and to build your life on him. Because he's worthy, church. He's worthy. He's worthy. Pastor Kevin is going to come and close in a little bit. I'm going to be out there. If you want prayer, before you drive out, just stop. I'd be happy to pray for you. I'd be happy to believe and agree with you that regardless of what you're facing, there is still hope. Don't make any major, don't make any major decision except for the decision to fix your eyes on him, the author and the perfecter of your faith. Would you lead us, team? Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever breathe. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Just to name above every other name. Jesus, the only way we could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we we'll live for you. Holy, there is no one like. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Worthy. We could ever breathe. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We we'll live for you, Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Precious Lord. We're going to close in prayer. I'm going to ask you to do something with me today. As we close this service in prayer, I'm going to ask you to pray with me. If you know someone who's going through a hard time, there is a phrase that came out in the song about opening the eyes. And in the passage that Pastor Fraz spoke on today, it talked about when Jesus broke bread, their eyes were open. And something happened as we were just closing with this song that we need to pray that people's eyes would be open, that their understanding would be open, that Jesus is with them in their situation, in their circumstance, in their need, no matter what but there might, they might have, that Jesus is with them. And if you know someone who's going through a hard time, I'm going to ask you to, to lift them in prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you, God. You are great. You are worthy to receive all praise and all glory. God, I am so thankful for what you've done in our lives, what you're doing in our lives, and God, what you will do in our lives. And God, right now, I just pray that you would move by your Spirit. I pray, God, for anyone who's here, who's watching or who will be watching, God, I just pray right now that they would sense and know your love and your presence. I pray, God, that their understanding, their spiritual eyes, their minds would be open, that, God, you are with them. They are not alone. Their situation is not too big. Their problem is not too big for our God. And that, God, you are with them to see them through. I pray, God, right now, that their understanding, God, would be open, that you are there. And God, I pray that the comfort and strength of your spirit would lead them and guide them, fill them, encourage them. May the peace that passes all understanding, the peace that you left us, may it fill hearts and minds today that, God, you've got us. You're seeing us through, and God, you are going to do great things. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lord, bless all who are here, all who are watching, our loved ones and families. 
I pray for protection and leading and guiding. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated here. I've got some instructions. God bless you for joining us online, and uh, we're praying for you as well. Uh, just, I'm going to ask the ushers to be uh, in their places. Uh, we are dismissing row by row. We're going to be starting at the back and working our way forward, all right? Uh, the only thing to really keep in mind is please uh, go slowly. Uh, please keep social distance as you leave the building. Uh, the little marks on the floor will help. So kind of go slow, ushers, so that people have time to get out. Um, we are asking, unless you need to go to guest services, please uh, feel free to do that. And there's a couple spaces to line up there. We are asking you just to make your way right out. It's so different than church as normal, isn't it? But I'm so glad that we're still able to get together and be together. And so God's going to see us through this part. And uh, over the next few months, we're praying that things will turn around. So I'm sure you can start dismissing. God bless you, and thank you for being here. Now we'll build it for better things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Now we'll build it. There's not a mountain that he can do. Oh, praise the name.